And the next speaker is Winslow Strong, who's a co-founder and CTO of Palo Alto Neuroscience. Please welcome Winslow. Thank you, Louis. You have fans in the audience. Here. Thank you. So we all know technology can empower us. It can also overwhelm us. Can ancient practices be medicine for modernity? I'll tell you a little bit of my story and how I got into this. I went to grad school in physics, and within the first year, I had pretty much burnt myself out. I was working 80-hour weeks. My research wasn't going well. I felt pretty depressed. Eventually, I got a mind-body disorder that expressed through pain in my hands. And fortunately, I had a friend who pointed me to Buddhist meditation. Um, the relief I got from starting a practice was immediate. And then, not long after that, I went on a several-day retreat to a monastery. And from that experience, I found myself in a state of consciousness that I never would have imagined was even possible prior to experiencing it. That lasted for a few weeks back in the world. And then there is kind of a slow decay, return back to a more normal state of consciousness. But that really alerted me and put on my radar um, that what was being pointed to by the traditional Eastern spiritualities was very real and just not in the conversation of our Western culture. Um, so I went back, I finished my PhD, I ended up switching into statistics. I kept up a meditation practice, but kind of like went to 20, 30 minutes in the morning. It's not a very intensive practice. And after that, I ended up getting really interested in this, what we were calling quantified self technology then, and I guess now we're calling wearables. Um, I had always had an interest in health and fitness and always been attracted to optimization and use of mathematics to facilitate that. So I, I loved these devices and gadgets, and I started playing around with a lot of them. I started a blog on the topic. I started a quantified self meetup group in Zurich where I was living. Um, but I quickly learned that there's limits to what this can do, and it's not necessarily the case that more is better. In fact, I even started to question whether I was really getting meaningful benefits from this technology. Um, I was putting a lot of time and effort into using it, into analyzing the data. Um, but when I, really, when I really reflected on it, I really realized that what I was looking for was more along the lines of what I had originally tapped into in meditation, rather than anything that this technology would be able to bring me. So I ended up leaving academia I didn't find much meaning or purpose there. I took some time off to travel, and I found myself uh, arriving here in the Bay Area in 2014. And here, I knew there was a lot of stuff that was meaningful to me going on. And as part of my exploration process, I went to a meetup called Consciousness Hacking. So we heard Mikey Siegel, the founder of that, speak yesterday. And um, there I met a tribe. I met a lot of like-minded people who had similarly had deep transformative experiences through meditation, yoga, and other spiritual practices, and also who had a background or an interest in technology and science. And there was this under overlying sense there that, that there should be a way to leverage technology instead of throwing it out the window use it for the purposes pointed to by the Eastern spiritual practices. Use it for transformation, for deep well-being, and for fulfillment of, of what we really want in our lives. So um, with that 
inspiration. And through that meetup, I met uh, a guy who had had this idea um, for 20 years to try to leverage EEG neurofeedback uh, for the purposes of contemplative development. And we met up, and the timing was good, and we started a company called Palo Alto Neuroscience. And that was two years ago. So I had returned through a kind of circuitous route back to meditation, but this time um, with the idea to bring technology into the mix and see what that could do. Um, so we were not alone in thinking thoughts along these lines. You even have quotes from the Dalai Lama. Uh, he's urged neuroscientists to find a way to use technology to induce in the brain the benefits of meditation. He publicly stated that he would be the first to use this type of technology. There's a famous meditation teacher, Shinzen Young, who said, someday we won't have to use this meditation technique. We'll have a complete circuitry diagram of the central nervous system that will be extremely complex, perhaps inducing at will experiences, from, uh, experiences of freedom from limited identity. So with that inspiration, um, and also y you can note that that academia has taken quite an interest in mindfulness and meditation in recent years. The number of publications have skyrocketed on this topic. But the issue there is um, they're not really studying the deep benefits and purpose that these practices were designed for. They're studying what's more kind of in the, the view or in the, in the box of Western science, things that are easy to measure and quantify. So in one of the best studies called the Shamatha Project that consisted of a three-month meditation retreat, some of their tests involved like discriminating between lines about that long and that long, and how long can you ma maintain your attention in doing that task. And I don't know, um, but that wasn't the reason I started meditating, and I don't think that's the reason most people started meditating. Um, so really it remains for these acad academics to look at um, the real goal of meditation. And the real goal is awakening. Um, as for what that is, I'm not going to really get into details here. That would require an entire talk or maybe an entire conference. But I can point you to an excellent book by Sam Harris. Uh, he's a public intellectual philosopher, a materialist rationalist um, who has a deep meditative practice for many years, was kind of in the closet about it for a while, and now is like totally out and wrote this book. Hey, look at this thing. There's this thing called awakening. It's a big deal. Um, also, back to Maslow's hierarchy, it isn't widely known, but towards the end of Maslow's career, he actually placed self-transcendence above self-actualization at the top of his hierarchy, which is pointing to what seems like the same thing as the Eastern spiritualities are pointing to with awakening. Um, so we have some, a lot of technology coming into um, this gap, this, this service of deep well-being, some ones in the meditation space that are popular, we have Headspace, we have Insight Timer. Um, these are great things to get people kind of started with the practice, to get some introduction to different techniques. Um, we also have a neurofeedback device that's a mass market device, the Muse. Um, the Muse is designed for meditation. It comes with a meditation kind of program. And it's a great device. It's a few hundred dollars and it is quite capable of detecting the difference between a ruminating mind and a quiet mind. And learning to train that is often a very first step in a meditative practice. But these are really just kind of you know, getting into the, the basics, into the shallow end of the development trajectory. And what we were interested in is getting much deeper. Here's just a few statistics on interest um, in the US population in this type of uh, in meditation and complementary health. Um, it's quite clear that the vast majority of people are not realizing awakening and not getting to the deep fruits of these practices. So we had the aim to uh, make that happen. Um, our approach is to use high-density EEG systems. So whereas with a few electrodes, you pick up signals that are emanating really from all parts of the brain and are mixed together, and uh, there's a lot of loss when it goes through the skull. We were going to use EEG tomography, which uses a high-density system, and it allows source localization. So through kind of like a triangulation process, you can figure out where the sources of EEG are in the head. And this is very beneficial, for example, cross-referencing with fMRI studies of meditation 
and just for being a lot more specific with matching the data you're reading to the functionality in the brain. Um, so early on in our development, the question arose, take a one-size-fits-all approach or take a more personalized approach? So a one-size-fits-all approach is what the Muse has taken. So the Muse takes individual baselines, which adjust kind of like your starting threshold, but then it points everyone in the same direction. Um, the, the attraction of this is that people who don't know where they're going in their meditation practice are led to a destination, so they have an orientation. The downside is that you're placing a pretty strong limitation on what the tool can do, and you're also being very heavy-handed in saying, like, you know, where, where does the desired objective lie? Where in, like, brainwave space should you be headed? Um, we decided this was ultimately too limiting. Um, a few issues are that, you know, we wanted to help people combine a traditional practice with the neurotechnology because we weren't as, uh, I guess, arrogant to think that we're at the stage where we can totally replace the traditional practices which have evolved over thousands of years. Um, we wanted to stick close to those and allow people the flexibility to like, walk any of those traditional paths that they wanted, and we could work with them and facilitate that. Um, and if you use a kind of a single you know, ground truth or, or endpoint goal with your tech, then you can't really do that. You're not very flexible. So we took a cue from the way that brain-computer interfaces use personalization and machine learning. So here you can see a guy controlling a robotic arm with EEG. And what they don't do is they don't do a study on a bunch of people, figure out on average what the, brain act, what the EEG activity is of me, say, clenching my right fist, and then hook up a human and have them trained to that until they can produce the average activity. What they do instead is, for a particular person, they imagine clenching the right fist in a number of trials. You label that data, and then you do machine learning classification based on that. So we figured, you know, it would totally make sense to use that same approach it, with a, a meditation um, application. And that's what we did. Um, so these three pictures kind of are the components of the approach. So on the left, you can see uh, kind of a famous meditation path. Uh, it's referred to as like the elephant path or uh, a shamatha progression. It has nine or 10 stages. And at each stage, there's very clear criteria on how you diagnose that you would be at that stage and very clear practices for how you might move from that stage to the next. Now, in any given meditation sit, you might find yourself kind of fluctuating between different stages, or you might find yourself able to access a stage you had maybe never accessed before. But that first time you do it, maybe it's under ideal circumstances on a weekend when you have like an hour or more to sit and are really relaxed. And you can't necessarily get back there the next time, which can be frustrating. Um, so our idea is lay a breadcrumb trail down. So when you hit that state, um, we'll take that EEG data and we'll build a personalized neurofeedback signal specific to you, specific to that state. And that neurofeedback signal will allow you to get right back to that state. So the idea is, you, you have had access to a state and you would like to have mastery. When you have mastery, you can then kind of easily move from there to the next. So, um, so the technology allows you to go from access to mastery by, by means of neurofeedback. And then the idea is you iterate on that. And you can walk this whole path, but you can walk it more quickly. And um, so that's our approach now but I think it's useful to take a minute to think to the future on what might be possible tomorrow. Um, not much of this has been very explored, and we have these kind of stimulation technologies on the market now. You see an ultrasound stim device there, and maybe something from the future there on the right. Um, so one metric we throw around, it would be great if we could reduce like a decade of intensive meditation training that monks would go through to something resembling like an hour a day for a year, and you'd reach awakening or some deep goal, um, that would be fantastic. Um, but we don't really know what the limits are here. And I just want to exhort this crowd that we have the tools, and there's no reason not to embark upon this development trajectory. 
it's time to give humanity a new operating system. If we don't, well, who knows what we might find in our future. Thank you. We're out of time but the, for Q&A, but that was perfectly time for the talk to the second. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Winslow. Thank you, Lee. Take care.